Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray. Please unmute. You are unmuted, bro. Dr. D, we cannot hear you. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Okay, let's start again. Let's yeah, start again, please. two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. We welcome you, dear Jesus. We welcome you right now. We come to adore you, Lord, with our faith, hope, and love, and to express a sorrow for our sins, to make reparation for our sins, and to thank you for all the blessings and gifts, so many of which we take for granted, and to present to you our needs, fears, and desires for you to guide our life. Alina is Santo. Kailangan kita sigla at lakas ng mahina pagat sa namin lahat. Oh. Father, Lord, we be to the Son, Lord, we be to the Spirit, now and forever, Amen. 
Jesus is here with us tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is here with us tonight. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 4 to 6, St. Paul says, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, 
He predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Now, our brother, uh, Joe Sisinski, mm. will be a teacher, our teacher today. He, he is going to, to talk about food. It's called, it's called phrase mana, the rima word of God. Mana means food, right, Brother Joe? Absolutely. I guess us bachelors always segue over to the concept of food somehow, but um, yes. uh, we're talking about a, a spiritual food greater than, uh, more satisfying than any physical food today. Amen. Um, well, thank you, Lord. Gosh, uh, uh, Vicki, if you'll roll the first scroll, the first uh, snapshot, and we'll start. Um, do you recall the story of the Exodus speaking of manna? The Lord, remember, he miraculously set the Israelites free from slavery in Egypt. He did that through the ten plagues. And then the Lord parted the Red Sea, and the Israelites passed through unharmed. You may have seen the uh, re this reenacted in the movie called The Ten Commandments. Remember, Charlton Heston played Moses. And then the Israelites were hungry in the desert, and they grumbled, understandably they were hungry. And what happened? God sent manna to feed them. What is manna? Manna is like a bread from heaven. Actually, we don't understand it fully how it came, except we know God sent it. The Lord sent the manna to feed the Israelites in the desert, and it was a fine, flake-like substance that tasted sweet. What does fresh mean? Because we want to pay attention to a fresh manna. Fresh means it's new, it's nourishing, it's nutritious, it's satisfying, it's tasty. Yay, fresh. We like fresh, right? I like fresh donuts and bread, but who likes stale or rancid old donuts? They're kind of kind of like a brick, right? They're hard. Fresh ideas, we like them. We need to discern them, but they can be revolutionary. They can change lives. They can change companies. And if we can't change, we can get stuck. How about fresh air? It's great. Have you been in a crowded place and the air is stale? Yuck. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables and eggs, more tasty and they're more healthy. We like, uh, what would stale manna mean? The manna ordinarily only lasted for one day. And on that day before the Sabbath, the manna harvested would last for two days. The Israelites needed to be industrious and harvest enough manna, one omer, which is a measurement, probably like about nine cups, to last for the day. And if Israelites did not trust the Lord, if they collected more than just one omer, I've collected more than they needed. The manna that was not consumed after 24 hours would smell and have worms. Yuck. So they needed to trust the Lord, collect just enough for the day, and then the Lord would supply again the next day. The Israelites were, were instructed to gather enough manna just before the Sabbath, however, to last for two days. So they would not have to work on the Sabbath. That way they could worship and rest, be with family and friends on the Sabbath. The manna collected just before the Sabbath would last for two days, reinforcing the idea of the Sabbath as a time to rest and relationships. Thank you, Vicki. The word of God, the scriptures are kind of like manna. Often a particular verse becomes very powerful for us. And uh, it could be many different verses. But for now, let's look at Isaiah 55, verse 10, 11. This kind of describes what we're talking about. The Lord says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. Does every single word from the Lord, especially during including uh, sacred scripture, accomplish everything that it should? Is it always effective? If we are honest, we must say, no, it doesn't always accomplish what we wish it would accomplish. What's the deal? What's the catch? We're going to look at that later. But right now I want to look at two different New Testament Greek words that are both translated into English as the word word. The first is the word logos, and it became really exciting 
when we begin to understand Jesus as the word, the Logos, but when the Logos occurs in the Bible, it refers to a complete Bible, the complete counsel of God found in the Bible. And for Greeks, especially philosophers, Logos meant different than the, the it meant for Hebrews. For the Hebrews, it was God's creative word. He spoke to Debar when God would speak. Sometimes there was a description. For man, it's only a description, but when God spoke, sometimes it created. Logos meant to the Greeks the comprehensive, sustaining principle of the universe. I know it's complicated. Uh, I can tell you a story, but I won't. The meaning of Logos was rich in two different cultures, the Greek and the Jewish. So then, next screen, when John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, this meant something very powerful to both the Hebrews and the Greek. And by the way, they're using the word Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Another passage that used the word Logos is Hebrews 4.10. The word of God, the Logos of God, is living and effective, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. That is great, but the Logos itself, don't be scandalized by this, the Logos itself does not change lives. We're going to go into that why. Now, what changes lives is the rhema word. That's when it becomes meaningful. There's another New Testament Greek word that is translated as word again, and that word is rhema. Rhema has a very different meaning. A rhema word is God's now word for the here receiver. It is a specific and relevant and timely word that speaks to us, you or me, that speaks to us, you or me, and ministers to you or me, meeting a hunger or other need or expressing a call of God to us, whatever. Uh, so a rhema word is not just head knowledge. A rhema word goes to our heart. Why are we going through all this? The reason is because at a prayer meeting, that's where we are right now. We're gathered at a prayer meeting. God is using us to minister to his people. I encourage us to read the scriptures, I say every week, but every day during the week, and be open to sharing a brief passage if the Lord seems to prompt us to do so. There could be hundreds, maybe thousands of themes that could develop over years at a prayer meeting. And sometimes at a prayer meeting, there could be several different themes being presented, being woven at a time, because the Lord wants to address lots of needs, not just the needs of one person. And I'm going to, let's see, I list a lot of possible themes, so let's go to the next screen because I don't want to take the time for that right now. There could be many themes. Whatever need is, God knows, and he wants to address that need. Sometimes a word deals with a specific situation that applies to only one person at the prayer meeting, but God cares enough. Remember um, uh, the, the good shepherd? He will go after the one in John 15. But one thing is important, that is, we try to be sensitive to what the Lord would like us to say or share or what passage or passages the Lord would like us to read. We try to sense the rhema word, the fresh manna. For instance, we know that the Lord loves us. However, sometimes that would not be the word of the Lord for a particular person at a particular time. And here's an example. He loved David. Remember King David? He was called a man after God's own heart. We all would like to be that, right? We're all trying to be a woman or a man after God's own heart. But remember when David sinned with Bathsheba, she became pregnant. The sin of adultery with Bathsheba led to another sin, murder. And this can happen. A sin causes to fix it. We try to fix it in our own way. It causes another sin sometimes. David instructed his general to set up Bathsheba's husband to be killed on the battlefield. How terrible. Now, we know he he's did one sin, then he did another sin. He committed adultery with someone else's wife, and then he killed somebody, and he thought he could fix it because the woman was now pregnant. God sent the prophet Nathan. Nathan's such an incredible prophet. I love Nathan and Samuel. They're so precise. He sent Nathan to visit David, and the message that day was not God loves you. Nathan told David something like a parable. There's only two parables in the Old Testament. This is one about a rich man who had a lot of sheep, but that man stole the lamb of a poor man to feed his visiting friend. The lamb was like a daughter to the poor man. 
was the only animal that poor man had. And David heard the story and he's just, he is mad. He was enraged. The scriptures say that David burned with anger against the man. David said to Nathan, the man who did this certainly deserves to die. And this is what Nathan replied. He didn't have to say it very loud. He said, David, you are that man. He didn't need to shout it. David was convicted it was him. Does that sound like I love you, my son? And we're going to get to the I love you messages later. But however, love message was not what David needed at the time, even though God loved David deeply. Furthermore, Nathan said that the word, oh, this was the sword. The sword would never depart from the house of David. And remember, Saul tried to kill David, but also one son raped one of David's daughters. Another son killed that son. Two different sons mm -hmm. tried to uh, steal the kingdom from David. One of those to even chase David around the country and tried to kill him. Um, Nathan prophesied with great precision, but it was not always good news or an understood that way. But see how the sin had its consequences. Uh, a little aside, recall the word from Hebrews 12, 11. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. In this instance, God chastened David because God loved David. Who has had that experience? Have we been at all disciplined by the Lord ever before? There are many other times in the Bible where God gave a hard word to someone. And we're not going to look at those right now. We can scroll to the next screen, Vicki. Thank you. I'm reminded of a verse from Hebrews 10, 31 that says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but pay attention. Yes, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but we don't need to go there if we are faithful to the Lord. The next screen is very important. It is, if you fall in the hands of the living God for doing wrong, it is terrifying, but it is a glorious thing, a joyful thing, a comforting thing a reassuring, encouraging, strengthening, healing, sustaining, affirming, life-changing, faith-building thing to be embraced by the Lord, the living God, and personally or corporately receive a special, timely, meaningful word straight from the heart of a father. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is revolutionary. It can change our lives. It can change our culture. It can give us strength, comfort, encouragement, direction. If we are attentive to the Lord at the prayer meeting, those are the types of words that the Lord gives us to share with others. We've seen it today. We see it every week. Thank you, Vicki. A rhema word can penetrate our hearts as long as we are open. A rhema word engages me. A rhema word is an encounter with the living God. I would even say it is a hug from God. A rhema word, as well as prophecy and other gifts of the Holy Spirit, are truly a God experience. They're like receiving a hug from God. Yes, prayer meetings are different. St. Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians 14 that the words of the Lord at a prayer meeting are for a purpose of edifying, encouraging, and comforting. I'll say that again. At a prayer meeting, we're listening to the Lord for a word that will edify, encourage, or comfort. What happens though if at a prayer meeting we get a word that does not line up with these three things, edify, encourage, or comfort? The word might be accurate, it might be from the Lord, but in such a case, it is almost always better to give the word of a person one-on-one -on -one rather in front of the entire charismatic meeting if it's kind of a correction, okay? Or maybe we should pray about that word and ask the Lord what he would like us to do with that word. If he gives a word, it's for purpose. It's not, God doesn't gossip. If he gives us a word, it's for a reason. Now we need to discern if it's really the Lord giving the word to us. Perhaps he's giving that word not to share. But so we will seriously pray for that person. Or as I mentioned early, so we can visit one-on-one -on -one with that person. Thank you, Vicki. Now let's look more precisely at the meaning of a rhema word from the Lord and some examples of a rhema word. A rhema word can penetrate the hardest, most fearful, most discouraged person if they, or if we, if I am open. You know, if I am given a word, but I'm not open, it's not going to do good. But if I'm open, it can, it can be transformative. The right Bible verse at the right time shifts that verse from logos and our head to rhema and our heart. 
even though a logos word, a word from the scriptures, is solid and orthodox, it might not be God's now anointed, fresh rhema word. For instance, I open the scriptures to genealogy, that might not minister to me at all. On the other hand, if I open to the scriptures, I'm going to read all of these. If I open the scriptures to do not fear, or I'm a child of God, we had that earlier from Bob's reading, that really might touch my heart. You know, we have so much, we don't have a good dad or mom, and we don't have a good self-concept, and suddenly we realize I'm a child of God. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. God loves me despite my little goof-ups. That Logos word has become a life-changing rhema word for me. Are you with me? The first verse that really touched me in my life, it was rhema, was, and I heard my priest from Father Charlie say it, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That became a rhema word for me. Now, let me explain to you something. The more familiar we are with the Logos, the complete word, the complete scriptural counsel of God, the more we can receive a rhema word, you know, be sensitive to the word directing it, the more able we can minister that rhema word. When we have a familiarity with the scriptures, the Holy Spirit can bring passages to our mind. So let's do that. A rhema word from the scriptures can be like a prophetic word or other type of revelatory word. In other words, sometimes someone will have a scripture and someone says, I confirm, or a prophetic word, someone will say, I confirm that with the scripture. Guess what? I cannot make a particular word change from logos to rhema. Only the Spirit of God can quicken the Logos word. The Holy Spirit can select it and apply it and make it powerfully relevant and can change lives if we're sensitive to present the right word. If that is true, and it is, we must become as sensitive as we can to the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can use us to touch and heal, encourage and nurture, and in every other of the way to love and meet needs of others. That's incumbent upon us. This applies us being led by the Holy Spirit to bring forth a rhema word from the scriptures. It also applies to us being open to other types of words, impressions, actions, and guidance from the Holy Spirit. For instance, if we're all together in a meeting, the Lord might lead someone to say, hey, I want to go and lay hands on that person. We can't do that from here. I could pick numerous passages that demonstrate the meaning and power of the word rhema. I want to repeat the reading from Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. And we know that this was in Hebrew originally. For just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and beautiful, so shall my word, it says rhema there, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. And I want to comment on that a little bit. We see that the rightful word, oh, go ahead to that screen, Vicki, that's fine. We see the power of the word of God rightly understood, rightly received, rightly applied. The right word at the right time is powerful, the fresh word. It achieves the end, it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. I'm not going to get too technical here, but I mentioned to you that in Isaiah here, it is a rhema word in the Septuagint. The LXX means the 70. I won't tell you why. But um, they, the, Greek, the Jewish people in diaspora in the Greek-speaking world got holy, faithful, intelligent people to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. It was around 280 to 250 BC. And they decided, in this case, the Greek word debar, which means God's powerful, creative word, should be translated as a Greek word rhema, which means God's now anointed word. That's why it doesn't return void. Um, okay, what is important as we see from this passage is to be sensitive, I'm hammering this point, to be sensitive to hear the current word that goes forth from my mouth, God's mouth. We need to be sensitive to that so that we can speak it out because we are God's voice. That is the rhema word. The rhema word is a fresh manna that we hunger for. Um, it's a word we long to hear. And here's a couple of examples. I'm not going to say them all. When St. Paul talks about the armor of God, Ephesians 6, he says to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema word of God. The Greek has Jesus saying the words, the rhema that I have spoken to you, are spirit and life. Next screen, it says, 
Oh, remember when Jesus was baptized? He went out to the desert. The devil's tempting him, and Jesus responds, and this is three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not by bread alone does man live, but by every rhema word, every now anointed relevant word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So clearly the rhema word is that which gives life. Thank you. St. Paul in Ephesians, you know, let's skip that one. It takes a long time to explain Hey, we just prayed today the second joyful mystery, remember? Oh, actually, I goofed. First joyful mystery. No, that's fine. That's fine. It was the first joyful mystery, the Annunciation. And Mary says, let it be done unto me according to your word. I typed it up wrong. I'm sorry. Let it be done to me according to your rhema word, God's present relevant word. And the next screen, please. Here's one more passage. I'm going to abbreviate it. Faith comes by hearing the rhema word. In other words, the right word proclaimed at the right time is so powerful and ministers to us at exactly our point of need. It builds our faith. It comforts, encourages, challenges. It's powerful. This is what we want. This is what we pray for at our meetings. Not just any part of the scriptures has power at a particular time, but the rhema word does. The rhema word is that portion of the scriptures that is relevant at a particular point in time. That same scripture might not be rhema tomorrow or next week. Respectfully speaking, it might be fresh manna today, but it might be stale manna tomorrow. And it won't have the power. It won't be as nourishing. On the other hand, that passage, I'm sure we all have received a, a Bible verse or a prophetic word before. And it could be a milestone for us. We might remember it. It might nourish us. For the rest of our, our life, we can turn to it from time to time and be reminded. Uh, a passage might be rhema for one person, not rhema for another person at our prayer meetings. That's okay because we give different words. For now, let's just see how the understanding of our, of our word rhema applies to our lives and to our prayer meetings right now. I'm going to say a few things. John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Since we are Jesus' sheep, let us learn to be attentive and expect Jesus to speak to us through his word. We can listen and honor when he gives it through someone else. But let's see, he may be giving us to one that will bless someone else. In our quiet time, when we were reading the Bible or even books with Bible-related themes, or when we were just being still, we can expect the Lord to speak to us through his word. And as we grow, we can minister to others. Number two, at a prayer meeting, in many different ways, the Lord brings a particular passage to our attention. Often that is because the Lord would like us to share that passage at the prayer meeting. Sometimes that impression by the Lord is confirmed because others might read that same passage, or we might read a passage with a similar theme, or might even be a prophetic word with that theme. So, yeah, to reinforce the message that the Lord is giving and to strengthen a person's awareness that he is truly hearing God, in this case, it's good to say, I confirm that, and then either briefly say, the Lord gave me this, that scripture too, or else we read a complementary scripture with a complementary theme or a prophetic word with a, a complementary theme. Thank you. Number three, usually a passage is read as only three to eight verses. Let me repeat that. Usually, not always, it's not whatever God wants. Um, the reason, like, for instance, let's say if we're reading a chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs, every one or two verse has a different theme. So if we read a whole chapter of Proverbs, we, we're diluting it. Let me repeat that. The reason is because if we read a lot of verses, there can be many different themes that could dilute or distract us from the primary theme. Usually the Lord wants to highlight only one or two themes in one passage. An exception to reading longer passage could be in types of passages, in which there's a narrative, a story, such as the passages when Jesus says, I'm a true vine or about the Eucharist or Psalm 1 or Psalm 23, those have a coherent flow of thought. And that's that's cool. But let's just be mindful to focus on the theme and then we can uh, really zoom in on God's rhema word. Thank you, Vicki. Sometimes a longer passage is appropriate. Let's see, I think I already addressed that. Okay, so next one. Number four, the main reason we gather, and I, I repeat this, the main reason that we gather is to worship the Lord. We also gather to receive words, to be ministered by the Lord, and he uses us to do that. 
But another important reason that we gather is so that we can learn to be sensitive to the Lord and to be equipped by him for service and ministry. This is a training place. We want to learn to be guided by the Spirit and to say and do the things that the Lord leads us to do and say. God's plans for our group, the COG group, are even much greater than to just praise him here and to bless the 25 or to 50 people currently show up at our meeting. So what is that greater purpose? Um, we are more than a Jesus Bless Me Club. ICOG is also training and equipping gathering. Uh, the Lord does not want us to just be blessed at peace here. He sends us out. Remember two main themes. If you break the gospels into two words, it's come and go. From here, he sends us out in the marketplace, the arena, the schools, the businesses, to the highways and the byways. And his power with his words, his direction, if we listen. We're trying to learn how to do that. Okay. A word of caution, and this is just a brief caution. We, yes, scriptures have great power. We can cling to them. We can believe them. But also, sometimes, you know, there's a little heresy going on that if we pick a scripture we want, you know, I'm going to be a rich like Solomon. We'll become rich if we just believe it. That may be the worst thing that God could do for us. You know, we can't just magically say, I want this to be for me. Let's pray about it and have a particular verse is for us let god quicken it so that we'll know okay number six if it exists oh we are god's servants speak lord your servant is listening he's not our servant he is our lord who loves us i just mentioned here in passing one catholic priest had such a powerful healing gift he would listen to god god how do you want me to pray for this person and he would pray for healing only for certain people and they always were healed but you know here this is what we want to do we're just going to believe that god who loves us wants what's best for us so we're going to pray unless directed otherwise 100 percent of the time for healing if in doubt we pray and believe for healing thank you vicky now's the time to step out now's the time to learn to discern the lord's voice now's the time to prayerfully take risk we love you all. We recognize that the Lord has called us all to be his hands and his voice. This is a safe place. We encourage you, please listen, step out, share a Bible verse, share an impulse, share a, a uh, impression is a better word, impression from the Holy Spirit. If you think it's Holy Spirit, step out and it's a chance for you to grow and it's a chance for us to be ministered to. If we believe that we have a word from the Lord, whether it is from the scriptures or prophecy, let's read the word loudly and clearly. Everyone else, except possibly the leaders, should be muted when the Lord is giving words. Hey, let's pray. God, what an exciting time, a time when you have um, reanimated your church. You've sent your spirit with power, with direction to make a difference, to change lives, to change the church, to rock the planet. And we're excited, Lord, and we say yes to you. We say yes, yes, here we are, Lord, send us, send us out, not by ourselves, but with your power. You said you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Come, Holy Spirit, empower us, direct us, guide us, send us to your hurting people to be your hands, your feet, your voice, your rhema word in this desperate, hungry, broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for that wonderful teaching. Amen. Beautiful teaching. Oh, Anointed teaching. Praise God. Thank, thank you, you, Lord. And now I'd like to ask our Senator Sid to sing God of Wonders. Amen. God of Wonders. The Rima. And please uh, mute yourselves. Mute yourselves. Mute yourselves. Mute yourselves. Mute yourself. You can sing with Sid uh, wherever you are, but just mute yourselves, okay? Thank you, Lord. Uh, everyone muted except Abby. Abby will help me sing this song. Are you there, Abby? Yes, <coughs> oh, I'm ready. Oh, it's are a duet. It's a duet. Muted, please. So do it with uh, with Senator Sid and Abby. <laughs> we will try. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, okay. Everybody muted now. Thank you. <coughs> the Lord does heaven and earth. The Lord does heaven and
beautiful creation of water, earth, and the sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our God. Thank you. 